Trinidadian. I grew up, um, I grew up in Trinidad primarily, and I came here for college and I stayed. And I come from a family where food is very important. My mom is one of the best cooks in the family. Um, that's not just because she's my mother. Other people would say that too. Um, so I grew up cooking from a very young age, just modeling her and following her. And, you know, she's she's a single mom and, you know, she still found time to cook for us. Um, really healthy meals, very balanced meals. Um, we had trees outside where we picked fruit and we hung out and, you know, all of that idyllic stuff that I think most folks would envision about a Caribbean upbringing. Um, <clears throat> so when I moved here, and, you know, post-college and just was realizing how, you know, in my immediate surroundings, the type of food that I wanted wasn't available, accessible, or fresh, um, or affordable at sometimes, um, you know, and I was, a, I'd have to go to different areas to get good food. And then when I had my son, um, my mobility was definitely much more limited. And so I really had to rely on my immediate environment for food. And just realizing more and more how difficult that was, um, I wanted to be a part of the solution. And the more I dug into what the solution is, I realized that it was really because of an injustice. And if it was because of an injustice, then the only thing that could really um, solve that issue is justice. And so I got really, I was always an activist, but you know, I was focused on other things and I got really involved in food justice. Um, really working to address something that I was living through, which is a lack of access to fresh fruits and vegetables for both me and my son. And so um, I got involved with Central Brooklyn Food Co-op. Um, at the time, it didn't have a name. It was just a group of folks under the banner of Brooklyn Movement Center, just meaning to talk about food access with, you know, uh, Mark Winston Griffith, who is the executive director of uh, BMC at the time, was a part of another effort um, in central Brooklyn to start a food co-op that didn't go well. And so he really wanted to reconvene folks to see if that was a possibility. And so we've been organizing central Brooklyn food co-ops since I was breastfeeding my kid. He's now almost 10. <laughs> so it takes a minute <laughs> to organize this work um, because it's democratically led, it's collectively led. We make decisions together. We share the risks, we share the rewards. It is the direct opposite of our capitalist based system where <clears throat> one person is sort of centered as the hero and um, you know, if that person wins, that person wins. Um, and if that person fails, that person fails. Whereas, you know, everything is shared in a cooperative. I can talk more about that after, but that's essentially through that work, um, I was exposed to a lot of different things within uh, food justice. I was able to go to conferences. I was able to build my leadership capacity, learn how to use Nation Builder, learn how to create um, a strategic plan, a communications plan, uh, social media best practices, uh, all of these things that we did uh, specifically towards the food co-op. These are skills and these are things that I learned in that space where it wasn't a consequence of me, you know, it wasn't a consequence if I messed up, right? It was a huge consequence. It was an easy place, a soft place to fall. So it was a way to test out leadership, build skills, uh, be in touch with people who also were doing this work, get ideas from them, learn from them, fail with them, and really just learn how to do this work well collectively. Um, <clears throat> So through that, you know, I was a customer of Fresh Food Box in um, Bed-Stuy when it first started. Um, it was in 462 Halsey and I was just walking around with my kid and just happened to see it and was just like, oh, this is great. And, you know, I filled out a survey and they asked what fruits and vegetables you wanted. And I foolishly put pineapples and mangoes <laughs> and you know, learn very quickly, you know, in becoming, um, you know, part of that CSA, why it was important to center, um, yes, shout out to 462 Halsey, I still go there, I was there just even yesterday, <laughs> um, but why it's important to uh, advocate for and, and eat, you know, nutritionally wise, locally wise, environmental impact wise, um, locally sourced produce. 
And so we, I mean, we do it to a fault now. We mean my, my son and I to the point, to the fact where he is actually in Trinidad and refused to eat apples in Trinidad because he said it's not apple season and he does not eat <laughs> fruits out of season. <laughs> So i um, very proud of that, you know, although I told him there's no apple season in Trinidad because apples don't grow in Trinidad, um, it's all imported. So I think he then requested that he eat fruits that were only uh, grown in Trinidad. So now I've created a monster, but anyway, very happy and proud about that little monster. Um, uh, extended from that, I've done work um, along the lines of um, policy um, where I can, do policy recommendations in various ways. Um, I've taken through my relationship at, at Central Brooklyn Food Co-op and Brooklyn Movement Center, I did a legislative advocacy course um, and learned that basically anybody could write policy. I think that's a thing that a lot of people aren't aware of and I tried to share that widely. Um, if you have ideas around policy and policy change, policy is really just rules and, and norms that are established in order to um, get something done, right? That's the very simplest way that I could explain policy. And so there are policies that create barriers to food access. Um, <clears throat> there are policies that are, um, that inhibit um, the growth of farmers markets that, you know, that affect directly the work that people are doing here. And so, you know, to think through different policy advocacy. I mean, it's really about problem solving. And, you know, I'm happy to work with folks that want to do that. I think that there needs to be more policy advocacy, um, particularly from youth. I think you all see problems much more clearly than we do sometimes as older folks. Um, and so I do think that that is something that folks should really think about food policy is you know essential to getting the work um, to getting food access um, in communities that don't have it. Um, one example of that is that a lot of food distribution is based in profit. Um, they're profit-based models, um, which means that it would be irresponsible of them for to invest and to work within communities that they don't believe they would make a profit in, and so. Um, the establishment of food hubs is very difficult difficult for a lot of communities and a lot of um, a lot of entities to to hold because a food hub is a food distribution system that has at its center values and not profit. And so when you see communities, um, I'll use Canarsie for example, where you know it, food access is difficult. I mean, all of Central Brooklyn, honestly. <laughs> um, a lot of it is because of certain policies that are in place that aren't explicit, right? Um, so, you know, in thinking through policy advocacy, what you do is that you look at what is existing in the landscape and, you know, try to figure out what exactly is causing that and think through policy that could address it. And these can go to city council people, you can go to your city council member and be like, I wanna write a policy based on this and they'll be very happy, trust. Um, I just left a meeting with my city council member <laughs> where I suggested some things, but you know, you'd have to work on it and think through it a little bit. But honestly, again, it's a means of solving a problem. Um, but anyway, back to sort of that career trajectory. So within that, um, you know, I'm I am also a writer. So I went back to school for my MFA in creative nonfiction. And that's what what I was I was working at Grow NYC. Um, fresh food box while I was getting my degree. And, you know, it was super fun to do something that was like very opposite <laughs> from writing. Writing is very solitary, uh, very heady. Um, uh, I'd work with other writers, but again, it wasn't the same. I would, you know, going and doing fresh food box, pulling out a tent by myself, setting it all up, you know, putting fruits and vegetables out, talking to community members about food and food access, giving people recipe ideas. It was really, really quite lovely. And, you know, I think it was one of the best ways that I got a very grounded sense in some of the challenges that are faced in terms of food access in the community and also people's relationship with programs like uh, Fresh Food Box. I mean, what I got on the daily was people passing by and be like, this food should be free. And, you know, that really cemented in me, you know, an argument uh, response really to folks who believe that food should be free. 
And so my, my general response to when people say things like that um, is that, you know, if food is free, then someone is getting, um, there's, there's an injustice somewhere, right? Um, and a lot of the times the injustice is at the community level because um, people can't, don't have the means necessarily to access uh, food that is culturally relevant and um, uh, necessary for their own survival and thriving lives. And so uh, that is definitely an injustice that needs to be addressed. Um, food, if food actually were to, to sort of cover equitably how everyone should be paid, it would probably cost a lot more money. Um, but because we have a profit-based agricultural system, um, it was never meant to feed people. It was never meant to uh, create uh, sustainable food access. Um, you, if you examine, you'd, you'd have to really go to that first to examine why our food system is the way it is, and then sort of expand it out to all of the injustices all around the food distribution system. And so thank you for highlighting that. I talk, I write a lot about this in various aspects of the food distribution system. Um, so feel free to read some of that. Um, but Ray, I have a question about something you just sure. said. Um, we get this question all the time about like, you know, the, the price of our food and um, it being expensive compared to groceries, uh, food in the grocery store. And I love your response about like, if, if food is free, there's an injustice somewhere. But yeah. I guess maybe I can imagine some folks could be feeling the injustice very personally. And how do you respond to someone who feels that, you know, their that injustice is with them, um, even yeah. though, yeah, like, I guess, what would be it's, a, it's, it's very something? difficult. Um, this is book I'm like looking up on my bookshelf, like y'all could see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, okay, so the book I was looking at is called The Hood Health Handbook. And I love that book because what it does is it talks about food in a very sort of personal way, but it also talks about it in an expansive way. So mostly I talk about food in a very expansive way. I talk about food access and I talk about food systems. Yeah, right? I'm sorry? Oh, no, I think somebody was unmuted. Folks, oh, okay. can you mute unless we're asking a question. Thanks. Um, and so um, from a personal lens, it's very tricky. That's about food choices. It's about, you know, people's ability to afford food. I try not to talk about that too much because that's a lot of generalizations that you get into. Um, what I can say is that um, folks that really understand the plight of farmers, the, the plight of what I call like the middleman, all the people that do the processing, the aggregation distribution, you know, basically the folks who are involved from, you know, getting the food from the farm to our communities, um, they are barely making it. And even if you start from the far, the point of view of the farm workers, um, you know, you, you get someone <laughs> to come and work a farm for one day <laughs> and then tell you how much you get paid for that. I think it would be very, very clear to you that these folks are very much underpaid. Um, what I try to do from a program programmatic point of view, I you know started a diabetes wellness program and we had a CSA as part of that. Um, we started off working with Stone Barns and we got the food from Stone Barns. We worked with Brooklyn Packers to get the food to uh, the folks. So we had a whole little system set up, right? And what I said to folks was, um, we can't give this food for free, even though Stone Barns is giving it to us we have to pay for and packers for this, we have to pay for package, we have to pay for all these other things. Um, and it's also not gonna be sustainable. Anytime you see food that is coming for free, um, you know, it's usually grant-based, it is not sustainable. Also, you don't have control over that food. There's no food that comes for free that the community can own, right? Um, and this is when you talk about food sovereignty models. Um, you want to have agency over the food that is coming into your community and the food that is coming into your homes. You cannot do that in a, a model that is emergency food based, that is charity based, because if emergency food and charity based model, that's um, whatever is left over or whatever people have access to, right? It's based on waste, essentially, at least from the start, the point of view of it. You know, there are models where people are purchasing directly from the farm. That's also kind of problematic because it's not competing <laughs> with food sovereignty work. 
that's a whole other story. But the point is that most of those models are whatever is left over, right? And so whatever is left over is not a food policy, a, a food sovereignty plan. You don't have access and agency. You can't make demands, right? You could only make demands when you're a consumer, right? And so as a consumer, um, whatever the food costs, whatever money you're putting into it, you are making the decision to purchase this, to support this, to support a food system that is sustainable, right? Not a charity-based system, a sustainably commercial, commercially, economically equitable, hopefully, <laughs> food model. And the reason why the food is more expensive than you wouldn't find in the supermarket is because it's locally sourced and, you know, we're working to pay farmers better. I mean, that's the easiest answer that I would give people. Um, you're supporting a local economy and you're supporting a farmer to make more to make money um, and live sustainable lives. Um, the opposite of that is everything else, right? A supermarket, you know, is able to purchase food at a lower cost. Um, most of that food is produced by people who live in and work in slave like conditions. Um, you know, this, that's that's what you're unfortunately supporting. And so, you know, what would you like to do, right? <laughs> and knowing that it is from a, you know, economic standpoint um, in a lot of people's personal lives, it, it may not be economically viable for you to do it. So there are other options, there are other things that you might, you know, want to do and think through um, in terms of, you know, maybe joining a community garden if you're able, um, growing some of the food if you're able, uh, but more so than that, um, we have to work on both sides, or actually in all spectrums of the food distribution system to make it more equitable, both for the community members and for the farmers. So that's a very long-winded way of answering your question. But, you know, essentially, you know, when I talk to folks about that, I say that there, there are different models for getting food into a community. And I would rather support the model that is supporting equity all along the food distribution chain. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I can, I guess I can stop there and just sort of take questions or I can show the, um, maybe it's a nice transition into the, the, um, the urban design forum. And I'll explain a little bit about that. So, uh, one of the things that I did that was super, super fun and exciting, um, was I applied to join a fellowship and I got into this fellowship. Um, it's called urban design forum forefront fellowship. And uh, they choose a different theme every year. Uh, the year before, I believe, was uh, 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 cooperative economics, so focus on worker-owned co-ops. Um, this year was food equity. And so um, we worked with designers and architects and planners to think through models and systems that create more ac equitable food access. And uh, we were working in various teams throughout the whole fellowship. Um, so one of the teams that I worked on was a team that builds um, a, a food assessment tool. And this was um, kind of a little bit of a realization of a dream for me. I've always wanted to create a food security tool, food insecurity tool. Scam likely always calls me, um, especially when I'm doing something. Anyway, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, so um, because what I found is that a lot of food security tools, um, they really lead people to um, emergency food. Uh, they lead people to go to pantries, right? And so it will ask you basically que basic questions like, you know, um, you know, do you have enough food to last for the next two weeks? So it was very much rooted in emergency versus thinking through how to support more equitable models like food, like a food sovereignty model. So, um, so, so <laughs> I think I probably wrote that paragraph actually, <laughs> if you could go up a little bit. So yeah, so a lot of my goal um, and the goal of a lot of the fellows as well was to move projects that were centered around emergency food to models of food sovereignty. And so what this assessment tool does, and this assessment tool is supported by the mayor's office of food policy. They reviewed it, the department of city planning. They also reviewed it as well. And the plan is for them to adopt it so that they can um, assess any um, 
any requests for funding um, for any food equity based um, or any any project that's meant to address food access. Um, and so, you know, our main goal was ensuring that the whatever came out of it was not going to be based in an emergency food model because we have a ton of them in New York. Uh, they are very well funded. For, I was looking the 990s for some non for nonprofits are up now, so I was just looking through <laughs> the budget of some of these organizations. Campaign Against Hunger has like an eight million dollar budget, guys. Like, <laughs> like I really people really need to be. You know, you think that these are like small nonprofits that are just raising money and doing good. Like, it's an eight million dollar operation. Um, go ahead. Right, right. If um. I, I think you've made such a great case for like, you know, if these charity based models are not sustainable, um, they're not equitable, and they uh, don't put power in the hands of the folks who are in the center of the problem, why do they continue to exist? Why are they usually the first uh, model that folks that, that you know, government cities, um, big agencies always think about versus like a more equitable version of yeah, of food models. I was. I really need like one way to answer this question because I have, I like twelve ways to answer this question. All right. So like, there was a there's something called the hunger and ta the the task force on hunger. I think it was it came out around 1969, I believe. I can find that specific thing for you. And this task force on hunger, I I kind of blame it all there, but it things happened before that really created the way that we do food access and food policy in, in the states, but. I really feel like this is sort of the way that it sort of got very organized, right, around emergency food. And the Task Force on Hunger basically said, and it's very long-winded report, that um, the root of hunger is a lack of food. And um, for people who know and do this work, we know that the root of hunger is poverty, right? Um, so instead of saying that the root of hunger is poverty, which most people who understand this work, sociologists, uh, people who've been advocating for, for, you know, different ways of approaching the food, um, food and accessibility and hunger have been saying this for a long time. So instead of addressing it from the perspective of policy, uh, of poverty, they address it in the perspective of like, just give people food because they're hungry, right? Um, if you were to address the root of hunger, which is poverty, you would look at things that don't have to do with food. You would look at housing, uh, you would look at jobs, you would look at um, minimum wage, you would work to improve all of those things. And so guess what? The government didn't want to do that. <laughs> um, and so emergency food as a corporate entity was really born and encapsulated in that way. Uh, I believe Arizona was the first state that had one, a food, a food bank. Um, and what that meant was that the government was actively funding these um, corporations and, um, you know, basically made them what they are today, which is longstanding corporations in the community with a model that people are so used to. These things existed before most of us were born. We were born into them. And so what it does is that it has a, a model that is based in waste. Um, you know, the the, at the time, there's all sort of historical things that were happening, but basically there was a lot of waste in agriculture. And so, you know, there was excessive dairy, there was excessive um, food in general. And so, but mostly dairy, dairy was in excess at, at that point in time. And so, you know, when you think about things like government cheese and like how much milk you get in, um, in food distributions, it's all because of this, right? Um, they are subsidized to give this food out um, and they're paid to give this food out. And so, you know, the model is based on waste and also volunteers, right? And so, you know, they very much hype up volunteers. It's like, you know, give back, you know, ask not what the, the, the government could do, ask what you, you know, you can do for this country and all of that, like, it's so centralized in our beliefs, right? In as Americans that, being a volunteer, going to soup kitchens during the holidays, like all of these things are part of our cultural lore, the way that we understand ourselves as Americans. 
We are people that give back. We're people that give to people. You know what I mean? So all of this is embedded in not only the culture, but the way that we do work, organizations and, you know, nonprofits, they always do giving days. Like these are things, again, embedded so much in the fabric of Americanness that, you know, to counter it sounds anti-American. Most people think I sound like an asshole when I counter this. And so, you know, again, it's because it's so embedded in the way that we think about food access. The first thing that people think about is just give them food. And a lot of that gets centered in that from that report and the way that charitable food had been established. Uh, there's a really good book. Um, it's called Sweet Charity. Um, Jan Papandayek, that's her name. John, Jan Papandayek. Um, I disagree with some things that she says, but in order to really understand, you know, how this historically, how all of this came together, that is a really, really good book to read. Um, Big Hunger is another really good book to read. That's um, by Andy, what's Andy's last name? I'm like, literally, literally look at Andy Fisher, Andrew Fisher. Um, that's a really good book to read, to really see how, you know, all of these things came together in order to create um, what Andy calls the industrial, I think it's the food and the emergency food industrial system. Um, and, you know, I think, thank you for putting the book recommendations. Uh, these books are really, really good. Just and even if you don't sit down and read them all, you know, in one sitting to just look through various parts of it, it gives a historical perspective on why things are the way they are now. Um, and, you know, why it's really important to fight back on these types of models. Um, you know, you're not being a greedy person <laughs> by saying, you know, or selfish person by saying like, we need to stop this charity based model. It's not sustainable. It doesn't work. Um, you know, I think during COVID was a very frustrating time for folks who do this work. Um, mutual aid groups that were being celebrated and lauded basically adopted the same type of, of decentralized uh, charity system. You know, they were, you know, using food that was you know, waste. <laughs> they were using uh, what, what was considered waste. I'm not saying that they were actually dumpster diving or anything like that, but they were using, you know, they were taking money from um, Norwich, New York. City Harvest was getting a lot of funding. If you actually look at those 990s and see the difference between 2018 and 2020, um, I think, you know, not to pick a campaign against hunger, <laughs> they're just really close to me. Uh, they're, they're, their budget doubled during COVID. You understand what I mean? Um, so if your model is based on how much food you can give to hungry people and you determine success based on how much more food you could give to hungry people, do you really have an incentive to decrease the amount of hungry people? <laughs> do you have an incentive? If you keep going to electeds and saying, we did so many tons and pounds of food and they, yay, great, good, good job. And next year we're going to do more. Why are you advocating for more hungry people? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't make any sense. And so it's like your model is based on increasing the amount of hungry people there, are not decreasing, right? And so your funding stream is based on how many people you can feed and by feed mean like, you know, how many more hungry people there are you don't have an incentive to change. So anyway, uh, <laughs> so in terms of this, this um, food insecurity model, so, you know, what it's working to do is to change that uh, focus on food security and move it more towards food sovereignty. And so um, this is a way for folks to understand how uh, the food spectrum exists in New York City in particular, in other places, you know, it could be easier to do more so food sovereignty based work. I actually don't think it is possible to do complete food sovereignty in an urban landscape. Um, but I do think that there is a way to work along to the spectrum of food sovereignty. And so some examples, if you could scroll down just a little bit more, um, just so yeah, so you have food security, right? Um, so equity is not explicit, uh, power is unspoken, power usually lies in the hands of the folks who are receiving the funding to do this work. At the highest level is the food bank, so the lower level is some of the nonprofits. Um, charity reliant, no connection to natural, political, social environment. So they don't have any um, 
they're they're not beholden to um, any environmental standards, any climate change standards. So you know they want to get strawberries from California that are destroying the environment. They'll get that right versus like a local, locally sourced um, uh, CSA, which will be like no, we're focusing on locally regional food. We have an environmental impact value system, right? Food security does not have that explicitly. Um, so for an example, a food bank. Um, and one way that really came to a fore, um, there's this wonderful article that talked about um, the funding that uh, the governor, the, the at the federal level, they were doing uh, towards farmers so that the food that was going to go into like restaurants and different things. That, and in New York, this, the New York version of that was Nourish New York, but there was a USDA version of it. I think it was like the USDA farm box or something like that. I can't remember the name of it. Um, it started off supporting farmers that were, you know, hurting during COVID and, you know, getting the money to them. And what they quickly realized was that there wasn't enough infrastructure built for those farms to get the food to communities. Um, and so instead of funding that infrastructure, government, uh, they, in the second year of the grant, a lot of those farms did not get the money and the support. Instead, it went to large scale food operations like Cisco, um, because they, you know, were cheaper and more efficient in terms of running their operations because it's much more centralized and privatized. Um, and so they were able to, um, you know, the people were getting less quality food, but they were able to basically like support, you know, food um, businesses and organizations that didn't need a lot of support and assistance, um, which was easy for them and horrible for communities and terrible for farmers, right? So people in communities were getting chicken from Slovakia. I'm not even kidding. That was a thing. Um, so food banks don't have an explicit value-based system. Some of them do try to support local farmers and agriculture, but that is not explicit and not really a part of what and how they do work. Um, so a food justice uh, model, it, the equity is explicit. There's you know, an implicit uh, understanding that there's a right to grow, sell, eat, and help have healthy food. Um, some people add culturally relevant to that as well. Um, there's a connection to natural, political, and social environments, right? Uh, so this is pretty much where uh, green market falls in. Like green market falls in squarely into this category, right? Um, green market does have an explicit equity lens in terms of supporting farmers. Um, they do have an environmental impact in, in terms of supporting local food. Um, and they do, you know, have, you know, whether it's explicit or not, I'm not sure. Um, you know, selling healthy food. Like you don't go into the farmer's market and find, you know, fried foods. You don't find, you know, highly processed foods, right? Um, and so there is, you know, whether it's implicit or explicit, um, uh, um, a values based in healthy food access. Um, and then there's a food sovereignty model, which is more community based and uh, community centered and community run and owned. So versus, you know, something like a green market where, you know, it's owned by a, a non, a large nonprofit that, you know, sometimes operates like a government agency, um, you know, the benefit that you have a community run, owned and run farmer's market where the benefits of it are, you know, going directly back to the community um, in whatever framework the community decides. I'd put a food co-op in there. Um, you know, those are, those are uh, food sovereignty based product projects that really center the needs of the community and all of the profits go right back into the community. Um, so a food sovereignty framework, food is a human right. Um, it talks about agrarian reform. That's more, you know, I think that is something that is more sort of in the lens of global food, um, but definitely something that we, we as Americans need to talk a little bit more about. Um, power to the most impacted in terms of community, um, in terms of, of farmers. And it really works to end hunger uh, from the point of view of creating this sustainable model that is owned and operated within the community. So in terms of the work that you know, I do, it's really about thinking through how we can in, encourage and support food sovereignty models within the community. And a lot of that could be like, you know, we could only work towards food justice. We need a green market in Bed-Stuy, for example. Um, and a food, more, more food sovereignty model would be, we need a food co-op in Bed-Stuy, right? Um, and so 
how how can you move your work more towards the spectrum of food sovereignty over food security? How can you create sustainable change within your community? And how can you work? And this is what I, you know, my personal, personal work. How do you work to have folks understand this more, right? How do you <laughs> craft your words? How do you talk about this? How do you do projects? How do you engage with community members so that people are supporting this food sovereignty model over a food security model? And I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges of my work. I work to do that in various ways. I like to think that this is the one, one of the ways that I'm doing that. And yeah, so I'll stop there. Um, I hope I didn't talk over. Um, no, that was great. I think Joanne raised their hand. Yes, hi. Thank you so hi. much for this. Um, it took me forever to get in um, with Eventbrite, but that's another story. Um, so I did come in late, but what I just heard you say, um, my one question is that you brought up poverty as a reason for you know not having food access. And a lot of, I work at the farmer's markets and a lot of people come up to me and they say, are the farmers being subsidized is, you know, through EBT? Is that why it costs $7 for a quart of, you know, tomatoes? And I feel that the 10 extra dollars people get through EBT, you know, it is getting food to people that is fresh and that is delicious, but I think it's, it is expensive if people didn't have EBT or the extra 10 for 10 um, and I do hear people ask me those questions often. So if it is, you know, the farmer's markets is bringing us fresh, delicious, amazing food to uh, an urban environment, yet what about the poverty aspect of it? Or, you know, not yeah. yet qualified for EBT, but, you know, still it's a struggle financially. Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, and with inflation, it's only getting worse. Um, when I was, I talked a little bit earlier about, you know, the sort of two sides to it. I mostly talk about it on the food access side and how to create more food access. I try to stay away from the sort of personal choice um, types of things because I feel like there's a lot of assumptions being made. But I would talk about it from my personal perspective as somebody who has been on temporary assistance, was getting EBT, was getting all of these programs and all of that. Um, and I've also written extensively about, you know, how to address these systems. First of all, uh, EBT, that when you do an application for that, it is um, the poverty, it's, it's on um, the poverty line, what is it, the AMI, right? The AMI hasn't changed, the average medium income has not changed since I think the 60s. And so what is considered poverty is basically being assessed, you know, from that level, right? Um, so that needs to change and that's a policy ad advocacy level that we need to address. Uh, the other issue is that, you know, when folks access EBT, particularly as a black woman, you're completely disrespected and, and treated subhumanly. Um, and so even accessing it, accessing benefits that you are entitled to because you pay taxes um, is, you know, highly problematic and borderline traumatic, if not just traumatic. Um, so there are all these things that, you know, you need to consider to even in, in, in thinking through and accessing benefits, right? So by the time that folks even have these benefits, right, um, they talk about SNAP as the, the, the um, acronym for SNAP is Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. And so they talk about it as supplemental, even though people use this completely for their food budgets, uh, they would say to you supplemental. So the amount of money that you're getting is not even enough. So you take all of that into consideration and you give this money to someone who is trying to feed their family, right? And, um, you know, these fruits and vegetables, not only do they expire quickly, uh, they cost a lot. And so there's not a lot of incentive to, to consistently purchase this, even though this is the healthy food you're supposed to be getting. So the farmers are not necessarily subsidized from EBT, right? They're, um, they're getting EBT as if it's regular money. It's, it's just cash to them, right? Um, the reason why food is expensive is because of inflation. Um, it's also because uh, food is not really the, there's this whole analysis called the real cost of food um, that works to really advocate for, you know, more programs to support farmers and um, regional agriculture in general, regenerative farming and all of that. Um, because if we really were to pay, pay the real cost of food, it would still even cost more. Um, 
so farmers aren't being sub subsidized. Um, people in the community, uh, the 10 for 10 is what, a, that's a newer program that was not around. Um, when I was receiving EBT, Health Bucks was around, it was two for every five. Um, so these programs are really meant to find ways to support people so that and to encourage, incentivize people to purchase fresh fruits and vegetables and to make it more affordable for them. And these programs really, really, really are integral to really addressing um, both from an economic standpoint and an access standpoint, uh, people's need to access fresh and healthy food. Um, in terms of what really needs to be done, um, look up, we have this thing called my plate, right? That says that you eat a balanced meal. And if you were to take all of the, all of the things that they tell you to eat in my plate, and you really take it to like the farms that these things are grown on, right? None of those farms are subsidized, right? None of those uh, actual fruits and vegetables, uh, grains, meat even are subsidized. What's subsidized is corn, dairy, soy, and wheat. All of the things that you find in processed foods, right? So this is a really long way of saying <laughs> Our food system is not created for folks to access affordable food. And so if our food system is not created that way and all of our advocacy comes and tells people to eat fresh and healthy food that they cannot afford and the government doesn't subsidize and is unaffordable or inaccessible in um, under-resourced communities, then you know we're all in a really tough spot, right? Uh, Thankfully, programs like this are working to address it. Um, there's really only so much that these programs can do until on all sides of the food distribution spectrum, we're able to advocate for equity. And yeah, I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> I hope I did a little bit, but if there's anything in particular you wanted to draw, you could definitely follow up. Um, yeah, I, sorry, John, go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, I guess, you know, I guess it's multi-tiered um, and, and difficult. And I I feel that while I'm excited that I work at the farmer's market, I'm excited for all this fresh, beautiful food that's there. I can see and understand some of the people with their struggle, you know, who perhaps don't meet the criterion for EBT. And yet it's, it's, a, it's expensive. I try to say the farmers drove here, you know, they grew the food, they have to rent the space. I try to support the farmers and say, you know, this is their job. And look at, you know, sometimes, you know, a truck breaks down and my farmer was driving, you know, a U-Haul to get there, you know, to bring the food to them try to make them understand the difference between this product and a product in a grocery store. And yet I understand the pain and the hurdle of the cost of the food. Yeah, you know, I, I do. Yeah. So thank you very much. Yeah. And, um, yeah. I appreciate it. I want to reiterate something that um, Ray said at the beginning that, you know, if food is free, there's an injustice somewhere. I think that's something really great to think about, but also, um, I know the farmers aren't subsidized, but um, the availability of, of income through SNAP and EBT is an income that they would have no access to. So looking at, you know, growing YC, that's a, billion, a million dollars uh, in the, ma the past couple of years. And I think last year we did $3 million in SNAP and EBT sales. And that's all money that farmers get to take home that they wouldn't have if, um, you know, if this temporary, supposed to be temporary programs didn't exist. Isabel has her hand up. Isabel, go ahead. Hi, um, thank you so much for this presentation. It's been really interesting and I'm excited to look more into the resources and um, try to bring more of the food sovereignty angle into our work. But that's specifically what I wanted to ask you about because you've been in the unique position of being a grown IC you know, field worker before. So I'm really interested if you have any thoughts about um, while we're in these positions, are there ways to incorporate more of the food sovereignty model into our work, um, if that's a possibility? Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot I can say about that. Um, you know, I, I had a lot of thoughts as a fresh food box coordinator that I felt, um, you know, could have improved the program, could have, you know, incorporate more of a community-based food sovereignty model. Um, and there wasn't necessarily a space to do that. And I would say, I would advocate for that space to do that. 
you folks are on the ground, you are talking to people, you are seeing, you're, you're on the front lines, you are frontline workers, right? You are on the front lines of what, um, of what is going on on the ground. And so for a lot of folks who are, you know, the decision makers in the organization, who are in leadership in the organization, they don't have that type of access and that perspective that you have that you can potentially bring. Um, so I would really advocate for a space um, for you all to sort of bring up certain things that you're seeing, address certain things that you're seeing, um, and really make that consistent. Um, in terms of moving towards a more community-based food sovereignty model, um, I would say that I'm a part of efforts to do that in Grow NYC as well. I'm working, um, I'm working with some folks um, at both wholesale and um, green market um, to think through uh, working, building out a food hub model in uh, central Brooklyn, uh, specifically with Brownsville, but definitely in central Brooklyn in general, working with Brooklyn Packers, which is a worker-owned um, uh, worker co-op that focuses on aggregation and distribution, and they also do their own CSA. Um, and, you know, just thinking through ways that uh, Grow NYC in particular can work better, more um, efficiently with community-based organizations and community-based efforts. Um, and that, you know, it's, it's hard for a large nonprofit to kind of like switch and change gears in the way that they do business, right? It's worked very well the way that they're doing this. You know, the farmer centered work is very important, um, but there needs to be more of an equity application in terms of working with Black farmers and with working with more BIPOC farmers, um, with thinking through how to build up their work and their business. Um, you know, how to work equitably with those folks. Um, so there's a lot of work that that needs to be done. Um, and I think Grow NYC is at a great position to do that. They have access to resources to do this work consistently. Um, and it's really all about just connecting a lot of these efforts in this work. So again, being on the ground, if you see opportunities that you feel like Grow NYC could apply and be more equitable to, uh, chances are things are already going. <laughs> And, you know, it just is a, a matter of just kind of connecting it, um, bring it up, have conversations, talk more, reach out to people, you know, think through, you know, how to connect a lot of the efforts that are ongoing with things that you're seeing and addressing some of these problems. Okay, uh, before I go to Joanne, quick question. Um, I don't know if you if you said it in your conversation, but how did you make that shift from um, journalism to food, food systems work and food equity and food justice? Because I know that there are folks here who are pretty new to these concepts, pretty new to this work, um, just giving them an idea of like, how can they make the shift from wherever they're at um, to being more involved and more invested and working even professionally in this space? Sure. Um, <laughs> good question. I made the shift from journalism to doing this work um, more fully uh, because journalism is in a mess and I could not support my single mom family <laughs> as a journalist, um, which is a whole other critique around journalism and publishing in general. Um, I have an MFA in creative nonfiction. I wanted to go back into writing and go back into that work, um, you know, post-grad and, you know, was not finding jobs that were equitable. Um, so I continued along the lines of what the, you know, I'd been doing. And so was getting more jobs and getting more, um, more opportunities through that. And that, I continue doing it and I'm fully passionate about it. I still write, I write for civil leads, I write for other publications. I, I'm trying to do more of the type of writing that I want to do, um, but it's definitely not a sustainable living for myself. And so as I'm talking about sustainable food access, I think that what's very important is that there are opportunities to create a career in this work. Um, but one of the things that I would say, you know, I have, there are a lot of folks that are in this work that are kind of solely in it for 
their own sort of centering and their own sort of um, success. And, you know, just to be very wary of that and wary of the types of models that they are supporting and the type of um, analysis or maybe even the lack of an analysis in the work, um, I would say that the position that I take um, is not a very popular one and it is not one that garners me a lot of friends in a lot of spaces and a lot of this work. Um, but my way of approaching this is, is that, you know, this work should be done with a moral center, with, you know, um, an equity framework as much as possible. Compromises could be made, but you should be working towards a value-based system. And if you're not doing that, then don't do the work. Just don't do it because everything else that exists is without a moral lens, without an equity lens, without working towards true community-based sovereignty. And so in order to say that you're doing that work, do that work or just don't do it at all. Great, thank you so much. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for, um, but it's been really great to just hear some of your experiences and some of the work that you've been doing. Um, folks who are here, I will definitely share um, all of Ray's work. Um, it's not just her, but there's a, a whole group of um, other fellows. Victoria, I thought, I, I actually saw your, um, your handbook, your toolkit come out maybe last month. I saw it somewhere and I was like, this is yeah. incredible. I can't wait to share it with everybody. So um, I'm really glad that you, we got to hear you speak and we got to hear you share. I don't know if Our you have any It's a group of folks, not just me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not just Ray. <laughs> um, do you have any closing thoughts for us before we sign off? I mean, yeah, I'm really excited about the work that you all are in, engaging in, both on the Grow NYC side and, and uh, the youth side. I didn't know that the farm stands were still working with youth. So I'm really, really mm -hmm. excited to, to know that and to see that. And, you know, I am also on the board of the Farmer and Community Advisory Group for, um, for a Green Market. And so, you know, um, we started a food equity uh, subcommittee. So feel free, you know, through Tutu or, you know, feel free to give folks my email if there are things, specific things that you're seeing in the farm stand that you think have any sort of equity kind of, you know, uh, consequence to it or implication, feel free to reach out. You know, I, it's always something to talk about. I can't guarantee that I'll solve any problems, but, you know, I'm always willing to engage in conversation and to move this work forward. So thank you all for listening. And yeah. Thank you so much, Ray. Um, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Again, um, if you join late, we will send a recording of this um, workshop to via Eventbrite to everybody who signed up. Um, if you have any questions, I'll send around Ray's email to folks. But it was really great to see you all. Thanks for coming and joining. Ray, this has actually been our biggest um, group so far. So thank you Yay. so much for joining our crowd. It's Yay. been really fun to hear from you. All right, bye everyone. Good night. Good night, everyone. Take care.